Hello and welcome to Future Squared. Stephen Hawking once said that intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, so let's adapt. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with preeminent thought leaders from a variety of fields to help you think in a multidisciplinary way, kick goals in your professional and personal life, and better navigate what is fast becoming a brave new world. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation accelerator that works with organizations to unlock their people's latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If you need help driving your organization's innovation strategy, visit collectivecampus.io. And without further ado, come with me if you want to live. In today's age, it can be hard to find the time to sit down and learn more especially if you've not yet turned off your push notifications like I've been telling you to. You might hear some of my author interviews and think, wow, I'd love to read that book, but with so many great books out there, you don't have the time to read them all. Well, there's one app I highly recommend, and it's called Blinkist. Blinkist takes the best key takeaways and need-to-know info from thousands of non-fiction books and condenses them down into just 15-minute reads. That's 900 seconds. Prefer to listen to books? Blinkist has you covered. As an advocate of short feedback loops, I like Blinkist because I can learn and apply key concepts to my business and life faster, which means I get results faster. I use Blinkist when I'm in the gym, pounding the pavement and commuting. I've listened to books like Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari and Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman on Blinkist, two books you should most definitely check out. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for Future Squared listeners. Go to Blinkist.com slash Future Squared to start your free seven-day trial. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T. Blinkist.com slash Future Squared to start your free seven-day trial. Blinkist.com slash Future Squared. And now for today's guest. I always like to fight. I mean, I kind of feel like... Um... You know, if if you're having a conversation that doesn't have disagreement, you're sort of wasting your time. It's definitely not productive because it's a nice to have and not a need to have. So I like to have, I like to get the debate right out in front and center. I like to know where the disagreement is. I think that's a big part of the success. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 357 with Scott Belsky. Scott is the author of two international best-selling books, including Making Ideas Happen and his latest book, The Messy Middle, which explores finding your way through the hardest and most crucial part of any bold venture. Scott has spent his career making the creative world more productive, connected, and adaptive to new technologies. He founded Behance, the leading online platform for the creative industry to showcase and discover creative work, and served as CEO until Adobe acquired Behance in 2012 for 150 million US dollars. He is a venture partner with Benchmark Ventures and is an early advisor and investor in Pinterest, Uber, Sweetgreen, Cheddar, and Periscope, as well as several others in the early stages. Scott also founded 99U, a publication and annual conference devoted to productivity in the creative world, and serves on the board of the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. Scott currently serves as Adobe's Chief Product Officer. In this episode, we unpack many topics, including one, how to keep your team motivated, even when there's a little cause for celebration, two, how to build a culture of transparency and psychological safety, three, why organizations who make fast decisions are more likely to win as opposed to organizations who spend a lot of time in meetings, and four, what the most sustainable competitive advantage you can have really is. We explored this and a whole lot more, so strap yourself in for a conversation with the one and only Scott Belsky. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, are you in uh, New York or SF at the moment? Every profile I found of you says NY slash SF. 
Yeah, it's a little bit of both. Right now, I'm actually in New York. Ah, uh-huh, fantastic. And that's where you're originally from, right? That is correct. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, well, Scott, look, I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. Um, enjoyed reading The Messy Middle earlier this year, um, as well as your previous book, um, How Ideas Happen. And um, essentially... I mean, nowadays, if you read TechCrunch, Mashable, Entrepreneur.com, they're all littered with stories about companies starting up and raising capital or companies exiting, but not so much about, say, that messy middle that you you refer to, you know, staying up, scaling and getting through that messy middle. What do you think that is? Well, I think people don't like to talk about the middle because it's not catchy. It doesn't make good headlines. People are obsessed with the starts and finishes. It's romantic. It's exciting fighting their major inflection points. But of course, it's really the volatility of the middle journey that defines products, defines brands, defines teams and companies. And I just was frustrated with the lack of conversation around it. Yeah. yeah. And I know uh, Jason Freed uh, over at Basecamp also echoes these sentiments. I had him on the show um, a few months ago and essentially he echoed the same thing saying that yeah it's it's just not sexy people just want to hear about starting up and raising capital but that you know that that messy middle essentially it's not sexy and if you watch a movie like the social network for example they kind of just rush past all of the testing of assumptions all of the sleepless nights all of the staring down into the abyss and from idea it becomes a billion dollar business literally overnight if you um uh, well, at least that's the way it's framed. Right. Exactly. It's, um, no, it's, it's a, you know, it's a series of ups and downs. It's a lot of self-discovery. I think that the, um, the middle stages are interesting because, you know, the, at the, at the valleys, we're not our best selves because mm-hmm. we make decisions out of fear. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and at the peaks, at our peaks, we're not our best selves because, we falsely attribute the things that we've done before to the things that work. And so we start to get a little high on ourselves. We start being a little headstrong and not as paranoid as we need to be. And then that's how companies become incumbents that get you know, disrupted by new companies. And, and so it's just interesting how, you know, whether you're at the peak or the valley, there's, there are some essential insights you need to have um, around how you endure the lows, optimize the highs and stick together long enough to figure it out. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And um, it's something you refer to in the book where you say that oftentimes we misattribute um, our success to the moments we'd rather remember as opposed to those we'd rather forget. And um, I think, you know, if you pick up most business books nowadays, they're essentially, you know, underlying all of them is this narrative fallacy. Um, pretty much every business book you pick up. Um, but in your book, you're basically saying that, you know, don't discount the role that um, luck might play um, in remarkable achievements. And um, without downplaying your achievements, Scott, I mean, what role do you think, or how did luck perhaps show up in your own success? Oh, in so many ways. I mean, I think that obviously timing is always luck. Mm -hmm. I think, and there's very many nuances of the timing of, um, you know, my first business, Behance, and, and, um, and how and what transpired. I think there's luck related to, finding the right people. So many of the key people on my team, I met circumstantially through random connections and coincidences. Yep. And, um, but I have to say, I do believe that a big part of what we call luck Mm -hmm. is really the, um, the awareness of the opportunities around you, which requires you to ask questions, to be more aware of what's around you as opposed to what's within, you know, and being a little less self-absorbed, you know, and, uh, and then also capitalizing an opportunity um, when, it's not, when it's not always obvious. And I think as people get busier and more successful, they stop opening their aperture to different opportunities that surround them. And then they wonder why they stop getting lucky. Yeah. And well, essentially, luck is a byproduct of actually doing the work and, and keeping the wheels in motion. And I think what, what is the quote? Luck is essentially an intersection of um, opportunity and preparedness. And unless right. you're actually doing the work, then you won't, uh, you won't get lucky and you won't be able to take advantage of that. And um, on that awareness piece, uh, essentially awareness and being able to solve problems and see things that other people don't see, that's just uh, a byproduct of taking on a lot of information from disparate sources, um, which is the essence of creativity, right? When you connect those disparate um, items. Yeah, I mean... 
who knows where creativity comes from. It's probably some combination of childhood trauma and, uh, you know, mistakes of the eye and also connecting dots and seeing where they go without any mm. clear plan and set of expectations. I think all of these sorts of factors play in. Um, at the end of the day, it's also time. Yeah. And, um, you know, how do you keep those windows uh, of non-stimulation in your life so that you can spend some time like churning through what's in front of you and, you know, allowing your mind to just wander a little bit. Mm. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I love the, the friction of travel because it takes you out of your zone. The time between A and B is a time yeah. where you are forced to kind of disconnect. Yeah, absolutely love um, airplane travel. I mean, a lot of people think I'm crazy when I say I love a 14 hour long haul flight to LA. But like <laughs> I said, you just disconnect, right? And it gives you the opportunity to read books, to reflect on life, to journal, to do all those things that perhaps your day to day just doesn't give you the time to do. Um, yeah. And, and also, I would say that in this hyper connected age where yeah. you're constantly keeping up with your inbox and overwhelmed, mm. um, maybe in this hyper connected age where you're overwhelmed with like constantly, you know, managing the inflow, maybe being disconnected is the competitive advantage. You know, maybe those who take the time to disconnect and have original thought, you know, maybe that's becoming like sort of the rare, scarce source of scarce resource. ideas. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it's something, um, I, I've reflected on as well, whereby we're living in this attention economy and, you know, if you, if you ride the subway to, to work or whatever it is, you, you look around and 95% of people will have their heads buried in their phones. And oftentimes they're just swiping and scrolling mindlessly. Um, whereas somebody who can control that sort of desire to reach for their phone and instead open a book or just reflect on, on, on life and their decisions, um, arguably there's a case to be made for them actually making better decisions, um, and more informed decisions and therefore ending up in a better place. I agree. Um, so, you know, in your book, Scott, you've mentioned that it usually takes about two years before we have any reasonable traction to show in business. Um, and this was actually a quote attributed to Doug Clinton. Um, he says, you know, you work for two years, uh, you, you generate some traction, you, you drive growth for a few more years, and then you create something that looks like a, a moat. Um, then you can afford to breathe a little. Why is scaling and getting past the messy middle so much harder than starting essentially? Well, I think that, I mean, uh, you know, conception is easy and it's easy mm -hmm. to have an idea and it's easy to get people excited about the idea. It's easy to start something when you're, you know, not smart enough to know what you're about to get into. Um, mm -hmm. And it's sort of almost like a bit of a ignorance is bliss scenario. But, but I then, but I then think what happens is real life catches up, up to you and um, you enter those doldrums of project management where there's no end in sight. Um, then you start have little, you have little incremental wins followed by suffering, and um, yeah. and you don't have the immune, the you don't have the reward system that we are governed by, which is typically, you know, you see something in front of you, you want to achieve, you achieve it, you get a reward, and then repeat. Mm -hmm. And when you're unplugging from that on a long term journey you have to actually supplement your short-term reward system with other kinds of short-term rewards that are, that are a little, um, a little, um, unordinary. I don't think what we can do is just say, Hey, we don't need those short-term rewards. You know, the long-term vision is enough to keep me motivated. On the contrary, I think you do. We're still human. We need those short-term rewards. Yes. And what are they? Those are games. We play with our teams, incremental milestones. We make up out of the blue. Um, you know, different things that keep us on the right path. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, Edwin Locke, uh, the psychologist talked about this in his goal setting theory of motivation, where he proposed short feedback loops so that you keep people motivated um, as opposed to say, here's our five-year plan and, and uh, let's, let's stay motivated and keep morale up, even though we're not going to see any value from our work for five years. Yeah. Um, and you talk about this in your book where you say in the early days, it can be tough and um, you should celebrate small wins, make them as small as possible in order to, to give people that dopamine hit to keep them motivated. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's part of it. And there's a creativity that you have to ha uh, have as a team to be able to make those and get excited about them. And then as the mm. leader, you're also crafting the narrative. And one of the analogies I use in the book is it's like driving a, uh, a car trip with your whole team in the back seat with the windows blacked out 
And people don't know if they're still sitting on traffic one mile into their journey or if they're making progress crossing state lines. And it's up to you as the narrator to sort of help walk people through and give them some context about where they are in their journey. I think that's an absolutely essential trait of a leader that um, yeah. you know, is, is not as common as it should be. Definitely not. And uh, as for those small wins, as small as they are, they need to be real wins, right? I mean, if we have fake wins, then we can essentially lead the team astray. Yeah. And, I, and as you know, I talk about in the, about the importance of not celebrating fake wins at the expense of hard truths. And, mm-hmm. uh, and you don't want to pay some you know, PR firm to get some article about you and then celebrate that article as progress because that's not condoning the behaviors that will ultimately help you win. You have to make sure that you are picking milestones and celebrating the things that are directional. Yeah. And uh, I mean, on media and progress, that's something whereby uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, particularly those in the early stages, may raise some capital and then declare that they've made it, right? They, they conflate raising capital with market validation. And um, as you know, that's not the truth. And in fact, raising capital can come with some hairy edges that a lot of entrepreneurs may not expect. Yeah, I, I have a, a, I don't like celebrating capital because I think first mm-hmm. of all, it's very easy to raise capital these days. And second of all, um, valuation is made up out of the blue, you know, and yeah. by no means doesn't mean anything. Uh, in fact, I think you should get more nervous when you're managing investor money because that means you just, now you're all now you're sort of uh, you know you're pregnant and you're you're committed uh, to this mm. uh, or you you know now you're you're all in and I think that it's it's um, uh, I actually encourage teams to try to do what they are doing long enough to really fall in love with it regard you know for for the for the for the journey itself you know loving what you're building so much so as opposed to raise capital right off the bat and then realize you may have raised capital for something you don't even want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And paradoxically, um, resourcefulness goes out the window. Oftentimes if you raise capital really early without having to real, without having to suffer or without having to spend, you know, a year or two trying to validate assumptions and painstakingly figure out what product market fit looks like. If you raise funding too early, then potentially you just spend it all on a team that you don't need and marketing a product that no one wants. That's true. And, um, and I, you know, I, I've always believed firmly that resourcefulness is more important than resources. It's, you know, I've seen yeah. a lot of teams with raising 40 or $50 million who fail. And I've seen a lot of teams raise little or nothing and, mm-hmm. um, and really succeed. And it's, it's oftentimes the muscle that you build by being resourceful, by trying to make something out of nothing. It's a forcing function for a lot of ingenuity. It's a forcing mm. function for great operations, for hiring people that are there for the right reasons as opposed to the wrong reasons. And that resourcefulness is a muscle that will stick with you forever and help you really build and scale a great business. Whereas resources is sort of like carbs. You know, you blow mm. right through them. You know, they make your problems go away for the moment. And then, uh, but then, you know, you're, you're not really building like the core, uh, uh, the core capabilities that are necessary for the long haul. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think that we, we also see nowadays, you know, there's movements like say growth hacking and whatnot, but essentially that sort of stuff, you know, lean marketing experiments was born out of necessity in the startup world where teams didn't have millions of dollars to invest in, in marketing and they needed to find novel ways to grow. That's right. And, um, and I, I think I, I have a little nostalgia for um, those days where capital was less available. So I think there was a different breed of company, you know, mm. being built in the early stages at that time. Yeah. And at Behance, you didn't really take on too much capital until quite late in your, in your journey. That is correct. Yeah. We were bootstrapped for quite a while and, uh, barely survived, but we made it. Yeah. It, it, you up, made it. it ended up helping us. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, I wanted to circle back, Scott, and, and, and earlier you're talking about the, uh, the middle and how, you know, there's peaks and, and, and valleys and suffering. And, uh, one thing you talk about in the book is that self-awareness is the only true sustainable competitive advantage. And I know from my own experience, uh, in entrepreneurship that it forces you to become a lot more self-aware, particularly if, well, it, it requires you to become a lot more self-aware, particularly if you're going to lead a team and get through the messy middle and give yourself a chance of success. Um, in what way did growing Behance uh, make you more self-aware? 
Well, I think I grew as a leader tremendously during that experience mm. because uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I realized many times that the ideas that I had were not the right ideas. I learned that some of the things that worked were not necessarily the things that I did, obviously. Um, you know, it was a humbling experience to know how required the team was, how I was just one little piece of the puzzle. And uh, mm. people give a lot of spotlight to the person who starts something. And frankly, you know, it, that, that's not what makes something happen. So yeah. uh, I think that, that that was part of it. I also learned the value of feedback. I think there were times where I would get very frank feedback from my colleagues or from partners of ours that really changed me as a leader, like where it was gold for me in my career um, mm. to the point where I really became obsessed with seeking feedback. I wanted to know what people thought. I wanted to hear what I could have done better because it just real. I, I saw it as a form of compensation, frankly, especially early in my career, because I just felt like I could capitalize on it so much. Like it, in every little dose of it could change the, the literal trajectory of everything I was about to do. And so I think that was one of those fr- you know new bits that was set for me during that experience that has definitely impacted my career. Yeah. Yeah. And that, um, refers to something you talk about as well, whereby you say that your longevity over time will be determined by your awareness of your weaknesses as much as your strengths. And um, nowadays, there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, radical transparency, to quote Ray Dalio, and a lot of companies, particularly um, in Silicon Valley, talk about this concept of psychological safety and people being comfortable uh, providing that candid feedback in real time. Is that something you looked to embed into the culture at Behance? It is. I mean, I, with my teams, I have a policy of sharing what's on my mind. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I look to hire people that value that. I also ask people for feedback, even those obviously who work for me. So uh, I just think that, you know, we're, we're basically all playing a game of emperor's new clothes where no one's telling yeah. each other what they really think. Um, and the more that you lean forward and declare, you know, what it is that you're seeing and what may, doesn't make sense to you, you're doing everyone else a favor and you're catapulting the product. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that applies also in life. I think a lot of personal relationships, people don't say what they really think and they end up, uh, hiding their true feelings and, and becoming resentful. And this could be of a, of a life partner or whatever the case is. And just by, being comfortable with hard truths and, and putting things out on the table, you're far more likely to have a constructive relationship, whether that be a professional one or a personal one. Yeah, I agree. Um, so, Scott, nowadays, uh, organizations like Spotify and Netflix uh, embody this notion of, say, a minimum viable bureaucracy. Um, and in your book, you say that the faster you move, uh, the more mistakes you make, the better your chances of learning and gaining the momentum you need to soar above competitors. But um, this can essentially create anxiety and it can hurt morale because people aren't used to that type of environment. At least a lot of people uh, who've come out of, say, MBA um, schools um, may not be familiar, comfortable with that type of approach because you're failing a lot. Um, what did you do to build a culture that leaned into this type of um, mindset or approach instead of shy away from it? Well, I think we had a, we had a sensibility in our team that we were just in it together. Mm -hmm. You have to go back and remember that this was in the 2000, sort of 2006, 2010, 2011, 2012, like those years in the New York tech community, there were not many New York tech companies. Um, Mm. It was also not a great time in the economy. 2008 was a little rough. And we just had this sense of like, we're going to stick together and figure this out. We built an incredible culture where we loved being together. We always laughed. Um, we spent tons of time together, you know, days and also the weekends working, but we just, and that we were in a time of our lives where this is what we wanted to do. Um, now do we have to, did we have to work that hard to make us be successful? I don't think so because I actually think that we had to over index based on our lack of experience. I mean, there was just Mm -hmm. a lot of stuff we did wrong because we didn't know better. And so we just had to, you know, triple X the, uh, the, the effort, I think, to get the same outcome. And I've learned that yeah. in subsequent projects that I've done. But, um, but it was, uh, you know, it was really the culture. The culture kept us together and the relationships. And I, 
think that we sometimes over intellectualize business plans and strategies. And at the end of the day, it's like about people who want to work together. Yeah, 100%. And um, I mean, in your book, it definitely does come across like that you know, the hustle culture, the long hours, the working the weekends was very much, um, you know, the, the, in the DNA of Behance. But if you were to start again, um, given all the narrative nowadays about, you know, getting into flow for five hours a day, you know, automating, outsourcing rudimentary tasks and, and taking care of your, your body and mind, would you do things differently? Um, if I were to start a business today, I would do a lot of things differently. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I, I think that's largely due to a different perspective I have, like some additional mm-hmm. confidence that I have and some lessons learned the hard way. Yeah. But what I would, what I would not do differently is I would very much focus on the relationships that the team is building, the people, you know, I feel like mm-hmm. that's a very core part of it that I would just, you know, I know that that's necessary and you can get a group of all stars together and still fail. You can get a lot of neophytes together and really succeed, you know, based on that difference. Yeah. Yeah. And um, on getting different people together, um, you talk about this notion of having tension uh, in the organization um, and that can actually drive people forward. Um, this, this echo is something that the former Google CFO um, said, where he said, you know, if you get a team of ambitious, opinionated, competitive and smart people together, that will create tremendous tension in the machine. Um, how does that tension in the machine, that friction actually help a company as opposed to harm it? Well, tension, um, you know, is, is, is part of the process of exploring the full terrain of possibility. And when mm-hmm. people are arguing around something, it's because they all have passion and they all have a different point of view. Uh, and that's extraordinarily valuable. In fact, what really kills the team is apathy. When people yeah. start to exit the fight, when people start to say, ah, you know, whatever, I'm fine with whatever, this is getting too heated for me, you're screwing over the customer. You know, at that point, yeah. you're done. And uh, so I think you have to fight apathy ruthlessly to keep people engaged in the fight. You have to hire people that are willing to withstand some tension because they know that that's part of finding the best solution. And these are all crucial, crucial points. Mm. And, and did you have any tactics to uh, combat, say, groupthink um, when people came together to debate topics? Or um, Well, I always... I, I would try to get the silent people to speak. I would oftentimes, you know, I would really um, make sure that it was respectful, but also like I, I like, I, I always like the fight. I mean, I kind of feel mm. like, um, you know, if, if you're having a conversation that doesn't have disagreement, you're sort of wasting your time. It's definitely not productive because it's a nice to have and not a need to have. So yeah. I like to have, I like to get the debate right out in front and center. I like to know where the disagreement is. I think that's a big part of the success. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, on, on that decision-making piece as well, uh, you know, sometimes organizations have a tendency to treat all decisions like big consequential decisions and as a result, never get anything done. Um, they off, ultimately become paralyzed. Uh, and I know you're an advocate of, Sometimes just listening to your gut and just making the decision and moving forward. Well, I think that, I think that, um, we'll take a step back and think about unproductive mm-hmm. organizations. You know, one of the things that plagues organizations the most is what I like to call organizational debt. And organizational yep. debt is the accumulation of decisions that should have been made, but weren't. And so there's a, there's a benefit to decisiveness. Also, even if you make the wrong decision, you actually learn faster than mm-hmm. agonizing over what the right decision is. And so I am an advocate for prompt decisiveness as long as the organization is tuned to reverse a decision quickly. Um, I think it just clears the cobwebs. It keeps people engaged in their jobs. It reduces the monotony of an organization in a standstill. And, uh, and it you know, clears organizational debt, which in my mind is one of the biggest things that gets in the way of productivity in a, in a company. Yeah, 100%. And uh, I think that echoes uh, Jeff Bezos and his type one v type two decisions. And most decisions are type two decisions, which are inconsequential and can be reversed. And as such, you should make those decisions quickly, as opposed to call a steering committee meeting every time a type two decision is to get made. Yeah, no, 100%. 
<laughs> um, and and um, on the other thing that really gets in the way of, of productivity in, in an organization outside of the um, organizational debt, you've, you've talked about insecurity work, uh, you know, all those little things that we do during the day that have no real intended outcome, doesn't move the ball forward in any way, and is quick enough that you can do it consciously multiple times a day. And that could be checking email voraciously. It could be checking LinkedIn voraciously, um, but not actually doing any work. Um, how did you, in this culture of um, hyper-responsiveness, build an environment whereby people didn't get, you know, carried away with insecurity work? Um, well, I think, you know, insecurity work is, it, I, I guess what I would always try to do and encourage my teams to do as well is find the things that we are repetitively doing um, that don't move the ball forward in any particular way that we are just doing for the sole purpose of feeling assured that everything is okay. Because when you're mm. in a bold venture or long journey without a known end, you're always wondering if things are off, if you're always scared. And, and I think there's, there's just so many, there's so many things that we do every day that are not necessarily solving a problem. And so the point about the insecurity work is just to audit yourself. And if you keep checking your mentions and social networks, if you keep checking your analytics for your website, if you keep checking your sales for your e-commerce brand or whatever it is, repeatedly, you have to ask yourself, like, why? Is this actually something that's going to actually make those numbers improve? Or am I just trying to assure myself that everything is okay? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes the, uh, I guess the biological predisposition towards doing the easiest thing, uh, picking the low hanging fruit rather, because it gives us that dopamine hit, makes us feel like we're moving forward, but essentially uh, we end up standing still. Right, exactly. Um, so earlier, Scott, we talked about how quick wins can help keep teams motivated, but once you actually are past the messy middle and the company is doing really well and, and revenue is growing at a, at a thunderous rate, at that point, it can be easy for people to become complacent. Um, you know, comfort essentially breeds complacency. So what do you suggest for leaders who perhaps find themselves uh, overseeing a company that's doing quite well in so far as ensuring people don't become complacent is concerned? Um, well, I think there's a, you know, I always like to say that you should be optimistic about the future, but paranoid and pessimistic about the present <laughs> and mm -hmm. the tasks yeah. that need to get done. And I think there's some, there's something healthy about, you know, always kind of knowing that the world is moving, you have competitors, you, you know, and it's all a great thing for customers. It's all a great thing for industries. It's, mm. you know, it's, it's bringing the bar up, but you gotta, you gotta stay nimble. And, uh, and I, whenever something works, I say, okay, what's next? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess that also comes back to the values alignment of uh, the people in the organization with, with the, with the values of, of the company. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so Scott, I mean, at the end of the story, essentially Behance was sold to Adobe for a reported $150 million and you're now the CPO or the chief product officer at Adobe. Um, I mean, how have you found that transition from running your own show for what was it over 10 years to transitioning to a large behemoth like, like Adobe? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I, um, I mean, my passion is to build products for creative people and, you know, I just <laughs> love enabling creativity. And so in some ways I have a dream job. I got to jump from the Photoshop team to the Premier Pro team to the Spark team to the XD team. I mean, I'm always focused on products and working with people, building products. And um, now in a big company, there's also a legacy, right? There's a lot of stuff that needs to change. There's stuff that worked before that doesn't work now. We have to make sure we think about where the customers are going in the future. It's also hard to appease a set of customers that are from one era, as well as mm. think about customers for the next era. And that's always a challenge. Um, and there's a lot of things we need to become better at. We need to improve our user experiences. We have to deliver more value to our customers. I mean, there's just so much um, that, um, that, that, is, you know, that is to be done. So I, I'm having yeah. fun. And I also continue to work with a lot of small you know, early stage companies as an advisor and an investor. So I think I get to have my foot in both worlds. And, and to me, that's a very good, happy medium. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. And I love that you called it a dream job in a way, because I think a lot of younger people listening to this might think that the only way they can have a dream job is by starting their own business, but potentially they could be doing work they really enjoy within, you know, the hallowed walls of a, of a large organization, providing it's the right one. Absolutely. And the beauty of being in a big company is when you get something right, you can push it to millions of customers immediately, as opposed mm-hmm. to wait five plus years to do it. Yep. Fantastic. Couldn't agree more. Um, I guess just on Adobe, I mean, oftentimes when large companies acquire smaller ones, uh, they often can kill them in, in a way, particularly when they try to absorb them into the mothership and suffocate them with process and all that sort of stuff. Um, what do you think Adobe did right in so far as the acquisition of Behance was concerned? I think that, the, that Adobe very much recognized you know, what our team was good at. And um, you know, the, worst, the worst acquirer is someone who doesn't know what they're bad at. <laughs> Um, yeah, Adobe is a very like self-aware company. I find, and the leaders are that way as well. They're, the company is aware of its strengths and weaknesses. Um, mm-hmm. The company is one that has evolved and grown through DNA from foreign companies. A lot of our products, including Photoshop, were acquisitions. So there is a good culture of incorporating new ideas and new people and new products, which helped us. And, uh, and then always, you know, being empowered to take on new things. It was a really key part of my own experience here. That was really a rewarding part of being here was getting to learn, you know, getting new responsibility. Yeah. Fantastic. And I guess, yeah, organizational self-awareness, I think is, is definitely key there, um, when acquiring small organizations. And, um, I mean, you weren't always a creative startup guy, uh, you know, you, you weren't always at Adobe or Behance or 99U. Um, you s- essentially started your career at, at Goldman Sachs. I mean, you spent four years there. Um, and I guess like many graduates from business school, you know, we, we go out into the world, we conform to society's conventions of what success look like. Um, and uh, as you pointed out in your book, the two greatest addictions in life are heroin and a weekly salary. And I absolutely love that quote. So on that because there's going to be people listening to this who are in the corporate world who are perhaps thinking about jumping out and starting their own thing. What essentially got you to overcome your own addiction to the weekly salary at Goldman's and take the leap of faith that was establishing Behance? Well, I think it was just a, you know, it's, it was an obsession with something, you know, a new idea mm-hmm. that I just couldn't get out of my head. And, uh, and then feeling like I, I was responsible for it. You know, you have a new idea, you get excited and suddenly you feel this degree of responsibility. Like you are a steward of something mm. and there was a pressure to like do something with it. And, uh, that was, you know, that was pretty heavy for me. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just like this burning desire to get out and you just knew you had to do it. You were just convinced. Right. Um, Scott, I really enjoyed today's conversation, but before we wrap up, I'm going to throw you into our three question lightning round. Uh, question number one is if you could work for any organization at any stage of the company life cycle, who would it be and why? Um, other than my own, you mean? <laughs> other than your own, of course. Uh, goodness. <laughs> um, hmm. I think it would be fun to have been in an early stage of a rocket company, you know, so you're trying yeah. to trying to literally do something out of this world. I would love to have understood some of the challenges and, you know, and obstacles of being in a company at that stage. Yeah. Would that be a a NASA or a SpaceX type company? Yeah. Maybe like a SpaceX type company. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, Question number two, Scott, if you could ask anyone a question dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Um, I think I'd probably ask Albert Einstein about, you know, how, you know, how much of, his success was mar- mer- mer- marketing or merchandising the ideas that he had and building mm. upon them with others versus like raw intellect. And I, I think I'd ask questions about where his sort of insights came from. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess oftentimes, you know, if you apply that to entrepreneurship, you might have a great idea, but essentially fail to market it and you right. end up with false, false negatives, essentially. Exactly. Um, and lucky last, Scott, uh, I ask all my guests this question, what sort of, uh, rituals or routines do you have to help you stay on top of your game? Um, well, I, I do try to, you know, really stay physically like engaged, you know, I try to work out and I find that it definitely makes me sharper. I, um, mm-hmm. I'm a compulsive task capture. I write down everything. I process everything. You know, I don't think I'm above that. You know, I take my own notes because I just find that when I 
capture something, it, it, it happens in a different way in my mind than if someone else mm-hmm. does. And, um, and I think I also try to measure the, the, how I use my time. Like I'll look back at my schedule and I'll ask myself, you know, was this a productive week? Did I do things that move the ball forward or not? Yep. Very well said. And any particular um, physical activities you're a fan of? Oh, I love running. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Well, great. thank you so much, Scott. This has been a, a great conversation. If people <laughs> My wanna... pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks again for uh, having me on the show. No, it's been awesome. And uh, people can learn more about, about you over at scottbelsky.com and on at themessymiddle.com. Uh, they can hit you up on Twitter at Scott Belsky and on Instagram at Scott Belsky. And of course, they should pick up a copy of The Messy Middle on Amazon. Thank you again. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day, Scott. Thank you. You too. Hi, guys. Steve again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, ebooks, and more that I'm publishing on a regular basis, just leave your details at futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe, and you'll receive the very next one. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. You can catch me on Twitter at Steve Gubeski and on Instagram at TheSteveGubeski. Until next time, hasta la vista, baby.